Good evening. Good evening. If I was standing here quiet, it was because I was waiting for Alex to give me a thumbs up that we were online, but I think we were online longer than I thought we were online. So good thing I wasn't twiddling my thumbs or picking my nose, right? Yeah. Amen. It's good to be in church, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you for those who are here. If you're willing and able to stand, please do. If you're at home, put aside everything that you're working on or looking at and worship with us, worship God with us, study the word with us tonight. We're only going to be about an hour, so you, if you, you can shut your TVs off, do whatever that you got to do to focus on what we're doing here in church, amen? Because we're one body, even though we may not be in the same room, we're still united in the spirit. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are good. Hallelujah. And you are the only one that is good as you are. None of us are good compared to you, Lord. And we thank you that your mercy endures forever. What a great God that we have who's always good and his mercy always endures forever. So tonight, Lord, we just thank you. We come before you tonight humbly before you and we thank you that you're good. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the gift of salvation. Lord, we thank you that you were devoted to us before we could be devoted to you. Think about that for a minute. He was devoted to us before we could be devoted to him. And so, God, we thank you for your devotion to us and for us, Lord, that you gave your son to die for us so that we wouldn't have to suffer the penalty of sin and death. And so, God, we thank you for your goodness tonight. Lord, we just open our hearts to you. We focus on you. We give you this time, and we give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
you are, yes you are. So good, so good. Yes you are, yes you are, yes you are. So good, so good. Yes you are, yes you are, yes you are. So good, you are good all the time. shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name. Through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Hallelujah. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your presence 
perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back. I know you are near. Let's sing that again. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back. I know you are near. And I will fear no With newfound faith, I will trust every word you say. All my fears I'm laying down at your feet. 
Let's sing that again. Lord, I come with newfound faith. I will trust every word you say. All my fears I'm laying down at your feet. I will trust in your grace that cannot be earned. Walk through the fire and not be burned. All my doubts have lost their sound to your voice. You are who you are, the God of the impossible, the God of the impossible, the God of the impossible. God of the impossible, the God of the impossible, you are who you are. Whoa. Lord, I come with willing hands, use my life to fulfill your plan. To you an offering. You are who you are. You are who you are. The God of the impossible. The God of the impossible. The God of the impossible. You are who you are. The God of Verse 2 again. Lord, I come with willing hands. Use my life to fulfill your plan. All I have, I give to you an offering. You are who you are. You are who you God of the impossible, you are who you are. The God of the impossible, the God of the impossible, the God of the impossible, you are who you are. Whoa.
God of the impossible. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you that you are that God of the impossible. Lord, no matter what we come across in life, it may seem overwhelming to us, Lord, but nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible for you, Lord, and we thank you for that. And so we come tonight with willing hands. Lord, help us to fulfill your plan. Lord, all we have to give you is an offering of our heart because you are who you are, the God of the impossible. Lord, you can work miracles in our lives. You do work miracles in our lives. You work miracles in the lives of those around us. Lord, help us to be faithful to you. Help us to be obedient to your word. Help us to be devoted to you as you're devoted to us. We love and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good evening. You may be seated. Hi. All right, so we're going to finish our series, our unshakable series in Daniel 6 tonight. And this is the most, probably the most famous story from Daniel's life, as we know. Daniel in the lion's den, right? Daniel in the lion's den. So in this story, we get a picture of Daniel's um, unflinching and his unshakable devotion to his God, which is our God, right? But we're going to call him his God for now. And Daniel, he didn't shift, he didn't change, he didn't shift with the wind. And th if you remember, his life in Babylon had been characterized by his unwavering devotion to God. Throughout his whole walk, throughout everything that he went through in, in, in Babylon, he was unwaveringly devoted or unshakably devoted to God. And it's never been on more display than it is in Daniel chapter 6. And I want you to just understand tonight that those of you, those of us, and those that are desiring to be devoted to God, you have to be loyal to those, you have to, you're loyal, let me rephrase that, if you're going to be devoted to God and loyal to God, you have to be committed to the God of the Bible, committed to the God of the Bible. And, and so, um, we, like I said earlier, we find that God was first devoted to us, he was first devoted to us. And so faithfulness is born in the heart of those that have a relationship with a faithful God. It's hard to be faithful to someone who's not faithful to you, right? But if God has been faithful to us, he's always been faithful to us, that's how that's born in our heart, because we have a relationship with a faithful God. So today as we walk through this story, I want to show you four principles tonight for a life of unshakable devotion, a life of unshakable devotion from Daniel's story. And we're going to see how this story points us to the chief motivating factor for a life of de devotion to God that allow that God, first of all, that God is devoted to his people. So let's start in Daniel chapter 6. We're going to go through the first three verses. So verses 1 through, th one through 3. It's almost a tongue twister. It pleases Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors of whom Daniel was one. So he's pretty up high there on the pecking order at that time in Babylon. Uh, the satraps, uh, so, uh, so three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because of an excellent spirit that was in him. And the king gave thought and settled him over the whole realm. So he moved him from one of three to being over the whole realm. So at this point, remember the, the, the Medes and the Persians, they took over Babylon, and now Daniel is most likely in his 80s. He's about 80 years old, Ted. Oh <laughs> and he finds himself with new government, because now there's a new, remember last week we had Belshazzar, and he died, and the Medes and the Persians took over, and so he has a new boss. And, and a lot of change has happened. And when you're 80, that's a lot of change, right, Ted? Right. <laughs> Some change is a lot of change the older you get. 
and, and Ted's not old, he's young, 80. And so a lot of change happened to Daniel at that stage in his life. And so this Darius uh, is most likely, it seems, either one who's been appointed by King Cyrus to rule over that area as a representation of that area, or it could be another name for King Cyrus himself. And so there are a few possibilities. But the big picture here to see is, is that Daniel once again stands out, right? That's what we see throughout so far in the book of Daniel. Daniel stands out, new government, same story. He's faithful. He's faithful to God and he's faithful to those that, that are leading him. And Daniel stands out as a man of integrity. And he stands out as a man of character. He's just different, right? When you have character and integrity, you're different. And people notice that. So he's, di he's different and he rises to the top due really to the sovereign hand of God. It's really because God's hand was on his life, nothing that Daniel did. And so Daniel has been made one of the big three under King or under uh, Darius, uh, kind of like a senior VP, right? And he's about to become a head of the whole kingdom and the whole area because the king trusts him. So let's move on in chapter 6, verses 4 through 13. So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Isn't that how the world works? They want to separate or divide you from God. And that's what they're trying to do with Daniel. How can we use God and, and divide Daniel by using God? So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and the satraps, so keep in mind, he, they're saying all of the governors of the kingdom, all of the administrators, all of the counselors, all of the advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the lion, den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing, and so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed and the written decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, with his window open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as it was custom since the early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and made supplication before his God, and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and they spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, this, the, the thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you've signed, but makes his petition three times a day. So what a picture. Think about that. What a picture we have here. Daniel falls victim to jealousy, right? The king has elevated him in the kingdom, and, and he falls victim to je jealousy, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. So Daniel finds himself being hated by those and, and that are jealous of his rise in prominence in the country. So therefore, they're looking for a way uh, to take Daniel out, and they can't find one. And so they only hope that they, the only hope they have is to find a way to cause his devotion to God to conflict with the laws of the land. So his, and then Daniel's, his integrity was so impeccable, their only choice and his only weakness to them was his godliness, right? So here's the first thing that we learned from Daniel about unshakable devotion. We have to be consistent in our walk with God. Be consistent in your walk with God. So Daniel's consistency in his walk with God is on full display in these verses that we just read. Again, notice the only way that they can take him down is to make him choose between God and the king, right? They put this new law in place or this new order in place, and they say, okay, king, if he worships, or okay, friends, if he worships his God, then we've got him. Or he has to go against his God and worship the king. 
And, and, this, and, and so they, they, in a sense, trick the king into to signing this into place. Because remember, the king likes Daniel, right? He's promoted Daniel. And, and Daniel, he sees that there's an excellent spirit in Daniel, and he trusts Daniel. And so they have to trick the king to come up with a rule about no prayer to anyone but the king for 30 days. So why would the king go for that, right? He's forming a new kingdom. He might think, here's a great way to unify people if they just all pray to me for 30 days, they're all on the same page, yada, yada, yada. And so according to their law then, if, if the law of the Medes and Persians, if the king signs this into law and makes it a law, he can't back down and change it. That's what, that's what it says, right? The king is not above the law. And so notice they lie to the king and they tell him that all the high officials were in on this. Is Daniel a high official? Absolutely he is. He would not have been on that, in on that, right? He was one of the top three. And so Daniel sees that this document is signed and it's law. And so what does he do? In verse 10, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as it was his custom since early days. So Daniel did what he always did. He just didn't start praying in his house that day. He's always prayed in his house three times a day for who knows how long, right? So he just went home and did the same thing he does every day. He just gets on his knees and he prays before God. We have to understand that. He did what he always did. He didn't change. He was consistent. He went to his house and he prayed. So like always, Daniel had a reputation for his devotion to God. And that reputation was born through prayer. And so Daniel was able to live like he did publicly because of who he was privately. He had a heart of prayer. He prayed every day. He had his own private devotion time to God. And so Daniel spent time with God in prayer. Therefore, then he was able to go stand for God in public. Do you get that? We as believers need to be able to uh, spend, we need to spend time with God in our own personal lives then it's easy for us to step out into the world and still be devoted to God. If we don't spend time with God in our personal lives, there's little to no chance that we're going to stand for God if we're coming up against the world. You follow that? So Daniel's not shaking his fist at the government here, is he? He's not cowering in fear. He's just being who he is. I just go home and pray three times a day. That's not going to change, right? He's living out his faith just as he did before. It doesn't matter that a new law was put into place because his devotion to God comes before that. The law is not motivating him or demotivating him because he's not changing. He's being consistent, right? Some people read that and they think, oh, now he's going to go home and pray now that the law's in place. No, Daniel always, because the verse says, verse 10, it says that he gave thanks before he's God as it was, as was his custom since early days. That tells me he always did it, right? It was his custom since early days. And so, um, so Daniel's consistency in his walk, his private walk with God, prepared him for that moment. It prepared him for the day when the king said, you pray before me or you're done, right? And, and we see that, that that was his practice, and we see that he had a reputation for his walk with God. At the same time, Daniel's consistency propels him in this moment or trial. It propelled him in this moment or trial. He found strength in God, right? He found strength in God. Why is he praying towards Jerusalem? Let's talk about that. The temple had been in Jerusalem in the back. That's where they came from, right? Uh, it had been there uh, uh, before Babylon besieged them. It symbolized God's presence. So he's looking towards the area to him that symbolized God's presence and he's expressing his longing for God. That was his pattern. So what is your pattern? Think about it. In your heart, when you go home tonight or when you get up in the morning or when you're at home during the day or when you're alone with yourself and God, what is your pattern? Daniel had a pattern. We need to have a pattern. Does your consistency in your walk with God propel you to deal with trials and adversity? in a God-honoring way. If we're consistent, it will. It'll propel us to deal with it in a God-honoring way. Are we consistent in our walk with God? Because people who are truly devoted, people who are truly faithful, people who are truly sold out, it's about consistency. Right? 
You, if you get up every morning and you just read your Bible every day, and you're consistently reading your Bible, that's consistency. If you get up and you pray every day, or whenever you pray, or worship during the day, we have to build that consistency in our lives, right? And yes, we all have inconsistencies. There's days I get up and I'm like, eh, I'm sleeping in today. It doesn't happen a lot, but it happens. And so we all have times where we, we, we where we, yeah, 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 we all have times where what we do, what we say, or what we think doesn't line up with what we know and what we believe. But the goal is to be consistent. An inconsistent life, if you have an inconsistent life, it's one that will, it's, it's, a, it's where we don't pursue God as a pattern of life. So having a consistent spiritual life is you pursuing God as a pattern of your life. So if we're not consistent in our walk with God, if we aren't constantly in prayer, and however we do that, if we're not constantly reading the word of God, if we're not constantly obedient to God, if we are not constantly pursuing the things of God, then our private lives are not preparing for us for public pressure. That's how you pr prepare yourself for public pressure. That's how you prepare yourself for things like COVID that's going on. That's how you prepare yourself for government unrest and civil unrest and people going nuts in our world, is that you have to be consistent in your own walk with God first, when then when you step out into the crazy world, you're, you're just consistent. Nothing changes. The world can't shake you. The riots can't shake you. The unjust in our country can't shake you. COVID shouldn't be able to shake you. The things in this world shouldn't shake you because you're consistently living after God. So then readiness is born in consistency. We become ready to live in this world because we're consistent. If we want to be devoted and loyal to our God when times get rough or times get tough, we need to consistently be walking with him all the time, even when times are not rough. I see it all the time, especially working with guys in the jail. They don't walk with God till they go to jail. Now times are hard, I'm going to walk with God. No, it's hard. You got to walk with God when times are easy, because then when times do get tough, it's still easy to walk with God, because you're just doing the same thing you always do anyway. And so we need to walk with God, spending time in prayer when times are good, right? right. Doesn't matter if times are good, bad. If, I mean, the sun could be shining, you got money in your pocket. There's nothing going wrong in the world. We still should be spending time with God in prayer. And we should be spending time with God in prayer when times are bad. And we should be spending time in prayer when we're young. And we should be spending time in prayer when we're older, right? Consistency breeds readiness and strength for any moment. Good, bad, young, old. Consistency breeds readiness. So let me ask you, is your private devotion to God preparing you for your public trials? Because we all are going to have trials publicly, right? Is our private devotion to God preparing us for public trials? Is your prayer life that consistent? It should be. What is your prayer pattern? Think about it. You don't have to tell me. When do you pray? Where do you pray? Or do you even pray? Right? And so we need a consistent walk with God if we want to live lives of unshakable devotion. Verses 14 and 15 of chapter 6. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself. So he just realized he got duped, right? And he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it's the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute with the king establishes may be changed. So once he put pen to paper, he couldn't undo it, right? And the king is upset, rightfully so. He likes Daniel. Daniel's a good guy. He's a good worker. He's trustworthy. And he just realizes he's been tricked. And his labors, his labors all, he labors all day to try to rescue Daniel, to figure out how can I get him out of this situation. But he apparently has only till sundown, and he can't do anything because the king is not above the law. Verses 16 and 17. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying, Daniel, your God, whom you serve continually, there's that word, which means what? Consistently. He will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring, and with the signets of his lords, 
that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. So the seal of the king would not deter anyone from messing with that lion's den, right? Once he sealed it, you don't want to get caught breaking the king's seal. And so the writer wants us to see, because of what's coming, that this was not some tinkered with situation. I mean, it was, it was planned out. They put the rock in front of it. They sealed it. They put the, their, sink, uh, their, their ring signals on there. Um, and they want, he wants us to know that there's a miracle when, when Daniel's released, as we know. So verses um, 18 through 34, we're going to read a bunch here real quick. Uh, 24, sorry. I have a typo. 18 to 24. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. And no musicians were brought before him. And his, slept went, his sleep went from him. Then the king rose early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a, uh, a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying, Daniel, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, there's that word consistent again, right, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel says to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, so they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent before him, and also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatever was found on him, because he believed in his God. And the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the lions, den of lions. Them, their children, their wives, and the lions overpowered them, broke all their bones in pieces before they came to the bottom of the den. What a picture, right? They, bear, they just are getting thrown in. They don't even hit the bottom and they're already half eaten up. But Daniel is kept safe. God sends one to shut the mouth of the lions. And, and it's been said that Daniel probably slept better that night than the king did. The king tossed and turned all night worrying about Daniel Daniel's laying in the, probably the bottom of the lion's den. The lion's mouths are shut. He's like, I'm just going to cuddle up on one of these fur babies and use it as a pillow. And he probably slept pretty well that night. <laughs> so Daniel didn't have a scratch on him, not a paw mark on him. Why? Because God delivered him, right? God delivered him because he believed in God. So number two, so first we have to be consistent in our walk. Number two, we have to believe God at all times. Believe God at all times. People that, that have unshakable devotion to God are people who believe God. They trust God. They have genuine faith in God. And we saw this in Daniel chapter 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They trusted God when they were going into the furnace, right? They trusted that God had a plan to deliver them from the fire or through the fire. They just simply trusted and believed God. And so do you know what it means to trust God? It's to believe him. I don't mean believe in him, it's to believe him, right? A lot of people believe in God. Demons believe in God, right? They shudder. I'm talking about believing him and believing his word and believing his promises, believing he is who he says, believing that he knows best regardless of what we may think or what we may think we know, believing that he is good and he is powerful. If you believe him, it's easy to trust him, right? So if Ted comes and talks to me every day and I believe everything that Ted says, it's easy for me to trust Ted, right? But if I don't believe Ted for whatever reason, I may have a little bit of an issue trusting Ted. And it's the same with God. If we believe the word of God, if we believe that God knows best, if we believe that God is all good and powerful, it's very easy to trust him. But it starts with believing him. Does that make sense? So Daniel had that kind of faith, that kind of belief, that kind of trust in God that shaped his entire life. It was all about what he believed about God, right? And, and he believed in the word of God. He trusted God. It shaped Daniel's choices. It shaped Daniel's priorities. It shaped Daniel's words. Our belief in God should shape our priorities. It should shape the choices that we make. Our belief in God should shape the words that come out of our mouth. Daniel's, uh, Daniel was different because he believed and trusted in God. Look at verse 20. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice. This is the king. 
When the king came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel, and the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of who? The living God. Has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? The king called Daniel a servant of the living, capital G, the God who created the heavens and the earth, whom he continually serves, right? This pagan king knew who God was. Daniel's God. He knew who he was. He probably didn't know much about God, but he knew this. He knew that Daniel loved his God. He knew that Daniel loved um, the living God. He knew that Daniel worshipped the living God. Obviously, he knew that he prayed to the living God, and he trusted the living God. And he knew that Daniel always continually served God and, and calls Daniel God's servant. And so he knew where Daniel's loyalty was, right? Because otherwise, why would he say those things? Daniel is believing God, he's trusting God, and he has faith in God. And that led to Daniel then being very deeply devoted to God. Look at verse 22. May God, my God, sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before God. And also, king, I've done nothing wrong. I've done no wrong before you. So Daniel says, I'm blameless before God and I'm blameless before you, king. Right? In other words, I've done nothing wrong. So God had vindicated Daniel here. So Daniel simply trusted God. He trusted that God had a plan in all of this. He trusted God to protect, provide, and vindicate his character. So if we believe God, not believe in God, but believe God, trust God, we can trust that God will vindicate our character, right? The world, the way it's going, we may have to have God protect our character because the world will come against us, amen? So Daniel was okay even if this cost him his life. He was okay, right? And I know this because it would have been very easy for Daniel to go, you know what, okay, fine, I won't pray to God for 30 days. Or maybe I'll just pray in my mind, God, for 30 days. I know you can hear me, because he does, right? But that would have kind of been buckling under whatever the king had, had ordered. And so Daniel believed God, and he believed that God was more worthy of his reverence and his fear than Darius or his enemies. And so when you believe God, when you trust God, you can't just fold your tent and go home, right? You just can't say, okay, fine, I give up, I'm going home. You can't just excuse yourself and not pray in this case, right? You can't just excuse sin in your life when you believe God and you trust God because you understand that God hasn't changed. The world changes, right? And the world may say one day, you can't come together and worship me. And the world may say you can't, you can't uh, post scripture on, on Facebook or whatever, right? But God doesn't change. The world is changing. God doesn't change. And his word hasn't changed. His word stays the same, right? That same Bible that you're reading today is the same Bible that you read when you were a little boy, right? And girl, or a little girl. Just because circumstances change, God does not change. And his word does not change. Believers need to believe that is true. That just because circumstances in our lives change, God doesn't change and his word doesn't change. Changing, changing circumstances give you a chance to show your trust in God. Think about that. Giving circumstances or changing circumstances gives you a chance to show your trust in God. A chance to show you that you do take him at his word and it's not a, to be time to bail right? On your walk with God. Again, look at what's happening in our world. It's easy, it would be easy just to like pretend we don't have a God and just walk out into the world and live like the rest of the world. But that's not what God is calling us to do. He's calling us to trust him. He's calling us to prove to him that through our circumstances, we still trust him and we take him at his word. Think about an umbrella. How many know what an umbrella does? I would hope most of you do, all of you do, right? And, and so think about an umbrella. It's made for rain, right? But how do you... Uh, so um, you don't really know if your umbrella is going to work or not till it rains, right? You can open it. You can take it outside and say, hey, it's kind of cool. This one's got a push button. Boom. <laughs> right? But you don't really know if it's going to work until it actually rains, do you? 
bad circumstances put our faith to test. Bad circumstances put our faith to test. So what good is faith that can't take rain, right? So let me ask you, do you trust God? Do you believe him? Do you take him at his word? And that really starts when we become saved, at a conversion, right? So to become a Christian, we have to believe the gospel, right? We have to believe the gospel, who Jesus is, what Jesus did for us. We have to believe that. We have to take God at his word to be saved. And we have to trust Christ for salvation. That's what salvation is all about. It's believing God. It's believing God's word. And it's trusting God for salvation. The Christian life is a life of faith, trust, and believing God. Faith, trust, believe God. Faith, trust, be that's your Christian walk. I have faith that God is there. I believe God. I trust God. And so to strengthen your faith, and so that, that or I'm sorry, uh, and, and, and that's every step of the way. And so God wants and allows sometimes circumstances and trials in our life to help strengthen our faith. A lot of us grew deeper in our faith in our lives when we came, went through a trial. And we're like, oh God, yep, I see now why I need you. And I see why I need to be consistent. And I see why I need to believe and trust you. And so sometimes he uses those circumstances to strengthen our faith and our trust in him. So, you know, I have a gym membership and I drive by the gym a lot, but I don't really go. <laughs> but if I were to go to the gym, or if you were to go to the gym, if you were to exercise, if you were to, if you were to run or lift weights, you usually get sore, right? So if you exercise, how many, or you do a job around the house that you're not used to, you get sore. But the end result is what? You start to build muscle, right? And you start to become more in shape, and you start to have more endurance. And so maybe... Um, that, that exercise can be a little bit painful, and the soreness the next day is painful, but the more you do it, the stronger you get. And that's how life is sometimes. Sometimes we have to go through some pain and some trials and some struggles, but the end is good, and it means to strengthen, not harm your faith. So a life of unshakable faith, which we talked about a few weeks ago, is a life of believing and trusting God at all times. Doesn't matter what's going on. God, I believe in you. Not in you. I believe you, and I trust you. Let's read Daniel 6, 25 through 27. Then King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, languages that dwell in all the earth. That's a lot of people. Just think if somebody wrote that today. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. And steadfast forever his kingdom is the one that shall not be destroyed. And his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? Look at what God did, right? God delivered Daniel, and then God causes this pagan king to praise him. He causes this, this pagan king to say, okay, world, worship this God. You know, the stage on which God performed this great miracle was a lion's den, right? It was a stage. So how did this come? Because first Daniel was devoted to God, right? He, he led, uh, uh, and that Daniel's devotion to God led to him being put in that, in that situation. If he wasn't devoted to God, he would never have been put in a lion's den. If he wasn't devoted to God, he wouldn't have gone home and prayed. But that put him in that situation, and then God worked through Daniel and in his devotion to him to bring about the circumstances, and then he was able to show his glory by performing that miracle. So Daniel was just simply a willing witness, wasn't he? That's my point number three. So number one, be consistent in your walk with God. Believe God at all times. Number three, just be a willing witness, because God wants to work through you. Just say, okay, God, here I am. I'm going to watch. You do the work. So Daniel lived in such a way that he could be a witness. He could provide opportunity for God to show and tell others that God saves, that God delivers, that God frees, that God protects. Notice what Darius says about the, the God of Daniel. He is the living God. Idols don't save, right? No idol in that kingdom could have protected Daniel unless you hit it in the head, hit the lines in the head with it, maybe. Uh, a false God can't deliver, but the living God can save and deliver. So people of unshakable devotion to God live with that hope that God 
will show the world that he delivers and that he rescues. That's how we, when we go out into the world, our, our goal should be, how can God work through me to show the rest of this world that God delivers and he rescues? So what was it that uh, Darius noticed about God? And what happened that made him praise God was the fact that God saved Daniel from the power of the lions, right? He saw that Daniel's God saved him. And so God's act of salvation on Daniel's behalf is what gets his attention, right? He, he had to obey the law. He put him in. He couldn't sleep. And the next morning when he gets up and Daniel's alive, that's what got Darius' attention. God has delivered all of you who are saved as well from sin, death, and hell, right? It may not be a lion. I'd rather deal with a lion than sin, death, and hell, right? He saved you. And he's rescued you uh, for a more powerful foe than the, from a more powerful foe than the lions, right? So if you're in Christ, like I said, he saved and rescued you from sin, death, and hell. God wants to make the world look at his works of salvation. Think about that. God wants to make the world look at his works of salvation in every one of your lives. He's saying, world, look at Joan. World, look at Kate. World, look at James. World, look at Joan. Look at what I've done in their lives. God saves from the power of sin. And so God's work in your in your and through your life is about more than just you, isn't it? God's work in Daniel's life wasn't about Daniel. It was about God getting glory. God's work in all of our lives isn't about me. It's about God getting the glory. God wants the glory. He deserves the glory. And so God wanted to show himself mighty in this pagan land to this pagan king because the only hope for Darius and the Medes and the Persians was the God of Daniel. No idol, nothing else was going to help them. Your marriage is about more than you. It's a witness to a watching world. Think about that. Your job is about more than you. It's a witness to a watching world. The way you handle slander and betrayal is, more, is about more than you. It's the way to be a witness in this world. So if you think about a play, if you go to a play, how many have ever been to a play? I've been to a play. You got a stage, right? And the actors are performing on the stage. So when you go to the play, the stars and the actors are doing the action, right? They're on stage. The people in the audience are what? Spectators. They're watching. They're just sitting with their arms folded, chuckling at Kate as she does a weird dance on the stage as an actor. <laughs> God's role in our lives is not just to be a spectator. We're, we may be on the stage of our life. God isn't sitting back just watching. God's not simply just watching your life. He wants to glorify himself on the stage of your life. He wants to be on the stage. He wants us to be off the stage, right? God built the stage, and he built you for his glory. And so in and through you, God wants to magnify himself. So our lives are like stages for God. He gets to show the world what he can do through our lives. To show up and show off in us. Isn't that cool? So my point is, is that God wants to point others to who? Not you, him. Right? So he may do something miraculous in your life. It's not about you. And a lot of us, we're, we're always excited to talk about God's miracles and look what God did to me and look what God did in my life and that there's, it's okay. But it's not what God's trying to get you to do. He's not trying to say, point at Russ and look at what I did in Russ. No, it's like, point them at me. So when God does something wonderful in our life, our job is to be like that satellite dish that orientates ourselves to God. And people look at what God di did and we point them back to him, right? So shouldn't we all be willing witnesses? Shouldn't we all be willing witnesses? Daniel was, right? He constantly pointed people to God. It wasn't about him. It wasn't about that he was strong and tough and I'm going to go home and pray anyway. No, it was about God and his devotion to God. And if you look at all the chapters leading up to this point, Daniel kept pointing to God, not himself. Number four, finally, be determined to finish well. So first, be consistent in your walk. Believe God at all times. Be a willing witness and be determined to finish well. We read the last verse of Daniel, cha Daniel chapter 6, verse 28. So this... So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius 
and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. That's how the passage ends. This is Daniel's time, story over and over and over. We see kind of he gets shoved to the side. Somebody has a dream. Daniel comes out. It's not me. It's God that's interpreting your dream. And he gets, he gets escalated uh, uh, in the kingdom. So no matter the situation or the king, Daniel always prospered. He always stepped up. He finished well. Why? Because Daniel, God prospered Daniel. It wasn't anything Daniel was doing. It was God working through Daniel. But this time it's different. Daniel's 80 years old, at least 80 years old at this point in his life. Imagine being thrown in with the lions at 80 years old, Ted. I like to pick on Ted because I know Ted's at least 80. <laughs> Daniel has served God and all these kings and kingdoms well. I mean, he started with Nebuchadnezzar, right? Then we saw him with Belshazzar, Belshazzar, and now we see him with Darius. He should be retired at 80 and living out his golden years in luxury, right? But here he is facing lions. And so the Bible is full, think about it, full of stories and examples of God using people mature in age, isn't he? Abraham was in his 70s when God called him. Moses was 80 when God called him to the burning bush. At the age of 85, Caleb requested to claim the land inheritance that Moses had promised him years before, saying in Joshua 14, 12, 85 years old, he says, Now therefore give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you have heard in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be the Lord, sorry, it may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. 85 years old. He's ready to go to war. So God may want to do his greatest work in and through you at the age of 60, 70, 80, 90, 95, or however long you're here, right? God has a plan for all of us. God has a plan for all of us, young and old alike. And God wants to work in and through us. And so we need to be like Daniel. I'm almost done. We need to finish well when God grants us long life. We need to finish well. We need to be like Caleb, confidently trusting in God, ready to charge hell with a water pistol at 85. <laughs> we need to think of Daniel in the lion's den. You know, it's not a children's or a youth story. We always tell it to kids, right? It's really a senior adult story. Daniel's 80 years old. He wasn't 15. He was 80. Who better to trust God in a, uh, in a den of lions than a man who walked with him in Babylon for 70 years? So a life of unshakable devotion to God means that a life is consistently walked with God. Your personal walk, daily walk with God, has to be constant. You have to believe God at all times. You have to live as a witness, and you have to finish well. And also, a life of unshakable devotion can only be lived by those who have discovered that the unshakable devotion of God, meaning God's love and his faithfulness, was given to us first. He was devoted us before we can be devoted to him. So we can't be devoted to God unless we know him as the one devoted to us. And we need to know the deliverer, the God who delivers, if we're going to walk in devotion. And so this, this story in, in scripture ultimately points us not to Daniel, right? But it points us to the deliverer, the one who freed Daniel. Daniel was framed with false charge, wasn't he? By those who disliked him, just like Jesus was. Think of the parallel here. Jesus was framed by religious leaders that hated him. Daniel was arrested after praying. When was Jesus arrested? After praying in the garden, right? Darius worked to see Daniel released but failed. Pilate also indicated a willingness to release Jesus, but ultimately he washed his hands of it, right? The big difference between the two is that Daniel emerges without a scratch. Jesus didn't. Jesus died for us. Yet that difference is what underlines the superiority of the reality of its foreshadow. Think about it. Jesus dies, but he emerges from the tomb, right? Let's stand. So Daniel's release reminds us that God can release us from our sin, that God can release us from death, that God can release us from hell. 
And it reminds us how Jesus went to the den of death. He didn't go to a lion's den. He went to the den of death, right? And he came out alive. He lived three days later. And it reminds us that Jesus did that for us, doesn't it? To save us. Christ died for us. It reminds us of the devotion of Jesus to us. Think about that. He gave his life for us. He laid down his life for us. It reminds us of the devotion of God who loved the world that he gave his only son. Do you want to be so devoted to God, to love God supremely, discover how much God loves you. If you know truly how much God loves you, you'll be devoted to him without fault. Right? Let Jesus, more than Daniel, move you to that deeper devotion. So if you're participating online, if you're here, do you know the God who delivers? Have you been rescued from your sin? And believers, are you pursuing a life of unshakable devotion? Is your private walk with God preparing you for that public pressure? Because that's what it does. It prepares you. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you that you were devoted to us before we even knew who you were, that you gave your son to die for us. Like Daniel went to the, 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 the lion's den, Jesus went to hell's den and death's den. And so, God, I thank you that you gave your son for each one of us. Lord, let us learn to be consistent in our walk with you, in our personal walk with you, in our walk at home, because that prepares us to walk out in public. That prepares us to deal with the struggles and the stresses and the challenges of life. But Lord, we have to be living that way daily in our own lives, in our private lives, because we just can't pretend we're that way when pressure comes if we haven't been living that way every day. Lord, help us to believe you, to trust you with our lives, to believe your word. Not just believe in you, but just to believe you and to believe what your word says and apply your word to our lives. Lord, help us to be a willing witness of what you've done in our lives. Help us to point people to you. Help us to see that everything that you do in and through us is to glorify you. We're just spectators. We're just participants. You're on the stage. You're doing the work. We're just walking it out. And then, God, help us to be determined to finish well, however long our lives may be. So, God, we thank you for the story of Daniel. We thank you for how dedicated, how devoted he was, Lord, that his devotion was unshakable. Lord, we saw him go through three different kings in his life, Lord, in all these different circumstances. But each time, Lord, each of those kings, most of the time, Lord, realize that you are the one that deserve the glory, the honor, and praise, not Daniel. And Lord, this world needs to know that you are the one that deserves the glory, and honor, and praise, not us. Lord, but we just keep pointing them to you. And everything that you do in our life, that just gives us another opportunity to point them to you. And so God, I thank you that you do work today, that you are alive and well today. You're not a dead God who's not paying attention. And you work in every one of our lives, Lord, even in the smallest things. You work every day. You wake us up every morning. You give us breath every day. Lord, we thank you that then we can use that to point people to you. Yes, Jesus woke me up today. I didn't wake up myself. Jesus woke me up. Yes, Jesus gave me breath today. Or whatever uh, large miracle that may happen, Lord, that we can point people to you. It's all about you. So, God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for your saving grace. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you for your forgiveness. Lord, we thank you that, that you love us enough to send Jesus to die for us. Let us be devoted, have unshakable devotion to you. We love and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. For you are great. You do me.
the glory. 